The skies remain clear here, but a lot of Texas is cloudy today due to a front in the area and the return of moisture. However, out west, we've got a major Pacific system coming onto the northwest coast there, and there you can see it, gusty winds up there in Oregon and Washington, and a couple fronts, and I'm not 100% sure of those positions. Maybe we can go through the charts and try to pin that down a little bit better. Now, notice I have the triple point here around Medford, maybe just north of there, basically in central Oregon. However, take a look at the upper air chart. If we outline the position of the jet axis, that comes on shore right around central Oregon, and it looks like that extends on down into Nevada. Now, we should not find the cold front and warm front north of that jet axis because there isn't really the upper air support. This is pointing towards the triple point being about right where we placed it with the cold front extending south and the warm front running maybe something like that, one of those positions. What could a cross section tell us? Let's try crossing the cold front into Northern California, and let's try crossing the warm front across Oregon and into Idaho. So let's try using the high resolution rapid refresh. And I'm gonna try setting a cross section kind of like that. Now you can see we're using theta E here, so we have to be a little bit careful. This would point to a cold front somewhat like that maybe very steep cold front, and looks like that's coming into maybe the coastal range of California there. Let's try taking a cross section across the warm front, somewhat like that. So what we have here is Central California, Nevada, and Idaho. I can, I can see that we're crossing into gradually colder and colder air. This region here is sloped. This is suggesting maybe a warm front way up here, maybe somewhat like that, based at about 43 north, 117. And that position is going to be 43, 117, about right here. So I think our warm front is actually pretty accurate. And then a quick word about our tropical storms. Tropical storm theta, that dissipated off the Carolinas coast. We also have theta. Theta is mostly going to affect a Europe. And then we have tropical depression 31. That's destined to become iota. And we can see there should be no impacts on the US, but this is gonna hit that part of Nicaragua and Honduras that's already been ravaged by Ada last week. Nothing on the five day outlook, but the next storm will be Kappa. So we're way up there in unknown territory with Greek letters for tropical storms. It has been a busy season. Elsewhere around the U.S., we're dominated by a large polar high centered across Missouri. That's putting much of the southern states under northerly flow. And on the other side, we've got intense downslope working on the northern plains and temperatures coming up to very warm levels, 40s with clear skies and much of the high plains. And then a quick look up in Canada and Alaska. That vague area of low pressure that we had yesterday has resolved itself into a new frontal system centered in southwest Nunavut. And we've got the cold front starting to form. We've got anticyclogenesis across Northwest Territories into the Beaufort Sea, and that will bring northerly flow and colder temperatures into the Western prairies. All right, time to pick up our dynamics lessons with fronts. So we are presented with a new frontal system in the northwestern U.S. So we're using tropical tidbits here and looking at surface isobars and 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. Okay, so our frontal systems will probably be looking like this. That looks like the cold front there. This little trough thing here, that looks like the warm front. So that's about what we're seeing right now. And everything up north will be an occluded front. So the upper air support will look something like this. 
That's going to be the jet stream. Let's look at exactly what we have. So here I have the surface fronts and a chart showing the 700 millibar winds up at about 10,000 feet. So based on this, are we looking at an active front or an inactive front? Are we looking at a catafront or an anafront? If you watched yesterday's videos, you should have a fairly good idea. Let's look at that upper level flow. I don't have that perfect, but you can see that the mid-level flow is coming in at a pretty sharp angle. So that's going to point to this being a catafront or an inactive front. Consequently, that will mean that the dominant precipitation mode will be convective. And very likely, we will find most of the precipitation along and ahead of the surface front. Now that's not a hard and fast rule. I know for sure that back here we're going to see a lot of showery precipitation. But usually when we're talking about the precip field in relation to an antifront or a catafront, we're talking about the stratiform area. So if the stratiform area was going to develop, that would be mostly out ahead of it. And probably co-located with the warm conveyor belt. So let's talk a little bit about warm fronts. The warm front, of course, is going to be a front where warm air is replacing cold air. So the frontal zone is going to be moving that way. This is to the northeast. This is to the southwest. And so this whole area will just shift gradually to the right of the page. Now, of course, you can see in the lower levels that a temperature discontinuity exists along the warm front, and that's its primary indicator, a temperature discontinuity because it is a boundary between two different air masses with different density properties. So if we look at the temperature along a warm front, we can see that it does represent a temperature discontinuity. There's the colder air to the north and the warmer air down to the south. There will be a thickness gradient. You can see there's a line right there, another line right there, and our warm front lies right about here. So south of that, we only find one thickness line. North of that, we find several thickness lines. And as with the cold front, the warm front will be parallel to the thickness lines. So let's take a cross section along that warm front. We're going to go from central Nevada up towards Spokane. So our warm front is very subtle, but it's located right there. The green is a plot of relative humidity. There it is right here. We can see that there's extensive values of high relative humidity north of the warm front. So you might be inclined to think that there's more moisture north of the warm front. But if we look at the actual moisture in terms of dew point, this is an absolute unit of moisture. It's actually how much physical water there is in the atmosphere. We can see that the values are not that much higher north of it. So even though it seems like there's more moisture, it's more foggy north of the warm front. It actually does not hold that much moisture. What's happened is it's closer to saturation because of the presence of cold air, and that raises the relative humidities. But the dew points are still on the dry side. So typically you will find higher dew points south of the warm front and higher relative humidities north of the warm front. That's an important distinction to be aware of. With warm fronts, there tends to be falling pressure north of the warm front and rising pressure, or steady, south of the warm front. The wind field is often backed north of the warm front. In other words, when you go from south to north of the warm front, the wind field changes in a counterclockwise direction. Another way to think of that is the winds tend to be more easterly north of a warm front. You can see that easterly component there around Boise, whereas to the south, the winds are out of the south. The warm front tends to be sloped towards the cold air, similar to the cold front. So at the surface, you're going to find the front right there, the 850 millibar front located further north into the cold air, and 700 millibar front would be found even further north. And if these fronts are highly sloped, they'll be found at a considerable distance. 
And when we look at a sounding within the warm front layer, we can see the telltale trace of a frontal inversion. Notice how the moisture follows the temperature line upwards to the frontal surface in this case. There it is. It's at about 650 millibars. That's going to be close to about 12,000 feet. Above that, we have tropical air. Below that, we've got the polar air mass. The frontal inversion located right there. And below that, the lapse rates increase a little bit, but since there's warm air advection, typically there's not as much air mass modification, so it tends to be more stable in that layer, and that can give you a lot of fog and stratus. As far as warm front characteristics, they tend to move more slowly than a cold front. The movement depends on the wind components across that warm front. Here you can see that the wind flow is a little bit stronger south of this warm front, so it should move northward rapidly through that area. Here the wind components are weaker, so we would expect slower movement of the warm front further east on that tail end. And then as far as cloud structures, well, I'm not sure you can read that, but I'm showing we have nimbostratus very close to the surface front. Further north, we have altostratus, more mid-cloud layers. And then down below that, we have scud, stratus, continuous rain and fog. There could be snow in there also if it's cold enough. And this is a definitely a good location to get mixed forms, such as sleet, in other words, ice pellets, or freezing rain. That's because the dominant process here is warm air advection over a cold layer. So warm over cold. So that means you're going to get warm rain processes aloft falling into colder air. And depending on how cold the lower layers are, that's going to control what kind of precip you get at the surface. But if everything in the warm advection layer is below freezing, there's a good chance that you'll end up with snow. And that'll do it for our Friday edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our many supporters like Robert Bellespirito, Jeremy Dawson, Sam France, Maynard Riley, and David Warnick. Supporters like you do help keep this program going. And I have to say, I probably am putting less time into my books and software than I should. I'm still trying to figure all that out, but hopefully we'll get more of a balance here. But for the time being, we will keep pushing ahead with this forecast program. So those of you supporting us, thank you very much. And we're moving into a weekend. I don't think we have much planned here. I'm going to probably crack open a few homebrews and continue watching The Americans. Very interesting miniseries. I like a lot of that Cold War spy versus spy stuff. So anyway, looking forward to it. Hope you all have a relaxing weekend also. That wraps up another week of Forecast Lab. Take care and we'll see you supporters on Monday and everybody else on Tuesday. Bye-bye.